أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور أرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله التيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعل الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته صلى الله محمد وعلى محمد My respected brothers and sisters, I begin in Allah's name, the beneficent to the merciful. Tonight is a night of grief. It's a night of reflection. It's a night in which we need to make commitments. Because tonight is the night 14 centuries ago, our blessed Imam was on the altar of sacrifice. And his actions and transactions are second to none when it came to the supreme sacrifice. That though his predecessors like Ismail, even his fathers, even the holy prophets, who sacrificed the culmination of all the transactions of this religion of Islam, which reached its ultimate perfection when the appointment of Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib والسلام, was done. <laughs> When the Prophet said, Man kuntum mawla fahadha aliyun mawla. And we know that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum ul islam adina. Today Allah says, I have completed my favor upon you and perfected for you this religion called Al Islam. Now the religion has reached perfection in the life of the Holy Prophet, but how do we know? its purity and perfection unless it's practiced. And though the messenger is the ark of the sunnah, meaning his transactions are central to all our characters that we should follow, you find that the exemplification of the sunnah of Rasulullah and the exemplification of the Quran in its fullest form was brought forth in Karbala. So we have many ways to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Either we reflect on the Quran but it will not come to its full fruition unless we see role models and examples who put these verses in action. And no one has put these verses in action besides the prophets and the aima. No one. In its fullest form, no one has done it. No one. And tonight, it's a night of reflection. It's a night of contemplation. It's a night that we send condolences to our living Imam Sahib al-Zaman, alayhi salatu was salam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. We send him condolences because his family was butchered for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His family was butchered to keep us awake and alive. That in this difficult world, if we do not look at them as role models, we will lose our pathways. We will become losers spiritually, materially, physically. Everything will become a loss. For sure, Allah guarantees it. Because they are the light in this dark world. That even those who don't believe in them, benefit from them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, and tonight I'm going to touch on some very critical points because we're blessed to have this night. We, the Muslim Ummah who love Ahl al-Bayt, because of this sacrifice, we are blessed to have these nights. That while we were busy chasing the world, we stopped in our tracks because the name Hussein was echoing in our ears. The name Hussein came to our hearts that we said, not tonight. Tonight we will dress in the black garb to show 
our utter contempt for what the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have done to the beloved Prophet and his family. And we keep this as a banner for ourselves as Muslims, whether we are in the West or in the East, that we will raise this banner. And this banner is not for their benefit. It is for our benefit. For their ra- banners have already been risen. Allah says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We have made your dhikr high. We have elevated your dhikr, O Prophet. It's for you and I when we hold their banner. Tonight is a sad night. It's a night in which we must have our hearts to cry. More than our eyes, our hearts should cry. Hearts don't cry. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, مَا جَفَّتِ الدَّمُوا إِلَّا لِقَسْوَةِ الْقُلُوبِ وَمَا قَسَتِ الْقُلُوبِ إِلَّا لِكَثْرَةِ الذُّنُوبِ Hearts don't cry when they are hard. And hearts don't get hard until they are filled with sins. So that means that when we have a pliant heart, a soft heart, that the minute we see injustice, anywhere where a child is being killed, the tears should come out of our eyes. Whatever race that child is, whatever philosophy he belongs to, whatever community he belongs to or she belongs to, when a child is being killed, when innocent women and children and men are being tortured and killed, tears should be flowing. These tears are ibadah. This is also ibadah that Allah bears witness. Look, you paid attention to my creation. That maybe if this hits you hard enough in your heart, tomorrow you will rise and prevent those usurpers from doing the harm. Tonight is the night we should remember that. Our Shia who love Ahl al-Bayt are being blown up as we speak. As you know, in Pakistan, people are commemorating Imam Hussein and a foolish person comes and blasts a bomb where people are so, they were changing their shoes, they were removing their shoes and the bomb exploded and 20 plus people were killed. In Pakistan, every single day people are being killed only because they proclaim the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib, they proclaim the love of Rasulullah the way the Prophet wanted it, the way Allah wanted it, and they are losing their lives for that reason. Is it fair? Is it fair that people in the haram and their bodies are being shattered, they say in Mashhad, when the bomb exploded, the pieces of flesh were seen on the ceiling. Hmm? In Karbala, pieces of flesh are stuck on walls because fools have taken bombs to explode and to blow children and innocent people. Should our hearts not cry? And we have to ask deep down, why are they so bothered when we go to the Ahlul Bayt? Why are they so bothered that when we touch the graves, why are they so touched? Why are they so disturbed by it? You know the irony of history, brothers and sisters, when the Umayyads came into power? Muawiyah vowed, he said, that brother of Hashim, meaning the Holy Prophet, he is mentioned every day. Mas'udi in his writing says that a man goes to him and says, look, you have become the Khalifa now. Settle down and stop your aggression against the Ahlul Bayt. Look what Muawiyah says. It's profound history, and I'm addressing this to the Muslim Ummah especially, not only to the lovers of Ahlul Bayt, to the Muslim Ummah. Pay attention, for the father of what is happening today is Muawiyah. He replies, Mas'udi is not full of Ahlul Bayt. He's from another school. A man with his son goes and says to him, stop your aggression against Ali ibn Abi Talib and his family. Stop it. You've become the caliph. Isn't that what you wanted? You wanted to become a, a caliph? You got it. Look what he replies. He says, the first caliph, Abu Bakr, came. He did good things. He died. No one talks about him. Pay attention. What is Muawiyah saying? No one talks about him. He said, the second caliph came. He did good things for Islam. He died. No one talks about him. Muawiyah is saying this. He says, Uthman came. And he did good things for Islam. And no one talks about him. But the brother of Hashim, everyone talks about him. Look at the difference of Muawiyah's understanding. Why was no one talking about the first three? There's a reason behind it. Because the Holy Prophet left us with the love of Ahlul Bayt. When did he say that we should have love for anyone else? The kind of love of mawadda, mutual love, is second to none. So that hatred... That hatred for the Prophet, who Muawiyah's father went to the grave of Hamza, Sayyid al-Shu'ada Hamza, who was killed in the Battle of Uhud. And his mother is the one who split the belly of Hamza. Hamza alayhi salam was a great man. He loved the Prophet, the uncle of the Prophet. That she splits 
his belly and takes the liver and starts to bite it. And she was known as a liver-eating woman. And Muawiyah and Yazid were known as the children of the liver-eating woman. These are the kind of people. Their hatred is because when we love Ahl al-Bayt, the way Allah commanded, we hold on to the rope of Allah. And they don't want this. So it's interesting historically that Muawiyah made sure he passed a decree that no hadith should be proposed to the public, spoken about. That's Fadil of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. No. In fact, they say Ibn Abbas, uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas comes to him and says, talk to me. Uh, he says, but don't talk to me about that Abu Turab. Don't talk to me about this Ali. So, Ibn Abbas replies, so you don't want me to recite the Quran? What an answer. Ibn Abbas says to Muawiyah, so you don't want me to read the Quran? He says, because the whole Quran is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Where should I start? Where should I end? What do you want me to speak? Tonight, what did they do? We must know this history. For when the Umayyads did all they did, they used to curse Ahl al-Bayt on the pulpits to destroy. Because that missing link that shaitan knows that the minute the gate to the city of knowledge is fixed, shaitan cannot enter it. All other religions lacked the gate. Hence shaitan went in and he made his own kind of religion. And we have carcasses of religion in the world today. But this one Allah promised. That's why the Prophet says, "Ana Madina tul ilm aliyun babuha." That akmal tulakum dinakum. What is akmal tulakum dinakum? The gate is there. You cannot enter it. The Holy Prophet said, "Woman arad al Madina. Whoever wants the city, then enter through the gate." Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. History, brothers and sisters. Why the hatred? I ask you today. Go around the world and see the hatred for the lovers of Ahl al Bayt. It continues to permeate that they are spending trillions of dollars to silence us. They are spending trillions of dollars to kill our scholars. They are spending trillions of dollars to kill our scientists and learned people in our community. Why? We do not promote hatred. We do not promote killing. We are the antithesis of terrorism. We are the promoters of peace and tranquility. Historically, we are the highest banner holders of peace and tranquility on earth in the history of the human race. And I stand to be challenged historically for the lovers of Ahl al-Bayt with the scions of justice and equity. Study history, you will see this. No time tonight to discuss it. But Allah is my witness in what I just said. Then why are we being hated? Because this love holds us towards Allah. And the treachery cannot come. We no longer become slaves. Imam Hussein taught us. I was born free. He looks at Hur. He said, your mother has named you well. For she named you free. Oh Hur, you were born free. How good that you have died free. Tonight, we have to ask ourselves, do I want to live on this earth free? Or do I want to be a slave? What do I mean by that? Do I want to submit to all the traps of this dunya and go away from Allah? Or do I want to submit to Allah? So history, brother, very brief introduction to history. So we understand the, the principles of what's happening in the love of Ahl al-Bayt. That why we speak today, our Muslims are being killed. Not only the lovers of Ahl al-Bayt. Even people of other schools of thought are being killed today. Muslims in general, there is this Islamophobia. You know what phobia means? It means you have an irrational irrational hatred or fear of something. When a phobic person has an irrational fear. See? Arachnophobe has an irrational fear of spiders. You see? Claustrophobia, irrational fear of tight spaces. Islamophobia, irrational fear. Not rational, irrational. Why? Because they are afraid that Islam will take over their lands not because it will rule them in a negative way. No. No. Even the Ottoman Empire, King Mehmet, when he defeated the, 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 Constant, the, uh, the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople, as soon as he entered 
their walls. He laid down his arms and said, Christians, Jews, all religions are free to practice what they want because this is what Islam has taught us. Did you ask that? The Jews and the Christians, they'll tell you. The Jews will tell you their golden age is when the Muslims rule them. Because Islam promotes this. Allah does not allow a single creature to be killed unfairly. This is why the name Islam, the root word is salam, peace. What an irony that we are being addressed as terrorists today when the very name of a religion on earth that is named properly is Islam. And you find all other religions are named after people and objects. People and objects. Only Islam is named after a true verb and a, and a noun. Subhanallah. Look, even Allah names it. Islam huh? Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing that as wise as you may think you are, you don't even know how to name your own religions. Salawat Allah Muhammad wa Muhammad. Historically, you find that the Umayyads had this venom. Then there was this pious Umayyad king, as we know, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, who stopped the cursing of Imam Ali alayhi salam. So you're talking about decades of cursing of Amir al-Mu'mineen. That today you read some of the hadith books, you find there are only meager few hundred hadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. Yet when the Prophet, when the first person Imam Ali alayhi salam saw when he was born, when he opened his eyes, was the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasalam. And the last person the Prophet saw when he left this world was Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. That means for that entire period when the Prophet was, the Imam Ali alayhi salam, during the time of the Prophet, when the two of them were together, they were like inseparable tree. And yet a few hundred hadith I allocated to Amir al-Mu'mini. That's the product of Muawiyah. That's the works of the Bani Umayyah. And hence this hatred. But among them, there are loving people. I remember last year I was reciting in Muharram, brothers from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah were crying in the lectures. And a brother came to them and said, why are you crying? He says, for two reasons. For the story is so touching that it brings me closer to Allah. But we are also very sad that our leaders and our scholars denied us this love for all our lives. Believe me, this is the truth I speak from experience. That those, even among those schools, when they hear the true story of Ahl al-Bayt, they cannot stop but to cry. Tonight is a night of reflection and crying. Shed the tears. And if you cannot shed the tears, then let the heart cry. Let it feel that, oh Imam, oh my blessed Imam, you stood on that altar to teach me how to sacrifice for Allah, to teach me how to be upright, that in the most difficult situation, that if I was to be taken, in any format on earth and be hurt and tortured in any fashion, I cannot compete with your tragedy. Then Imam says, look up to me and take consolation that I am your best role model tonight. And what are these role models? But before I go there, I want to complete this point. That the Umayyads established this stance. The irony, irony, we must take lessons from that. That though we may claim to be Ahl al-Bayt lovers, and inshallah we are, Let's not fall into the cracks and the traps that the Banu Abbas did. As you know, the children of Abbas, they were the uncle of the Holy Prophet. Their children claimed to rise in the revenge of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi massacre in Karbala and his family. And the Abbasid rose against the Umayyads. And the Umayyads crumbled. And look at the irony, brothers and sisters, the irony. And shaitan doesn't stop. And you think he's going to leave us alone? You think you and I can go to sleep at night free? No, 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 no. That's not how Iblis works. He's vigilant. Iblis said, by your authority, I'm going to get them all. Look how he works. That the Banu Abbasid raised black flags in the revenge and the avenge of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salatu wasalam's shahada. You want to see monsters who had even greater hatred that they had meted out so much killing and bloodshed, it was the Abbasids. That after the Umayyads collapsed, for 1,000 months, Umayyads ruled. 1,000 months exactly, the Umayyads ruled. Then the Abbasids took over. They said the Banu Abbasid had passed the rule that even to approach the Haram was Haram. Don't even go near the Haram. I am shocked in history that by you were the people who raised the banner for the, for the Shahada of Hussein ibn Ali. Alayhi now you don't want people to go to the grave of Hussein ibn Ali? Why? Why? Why don't you want to go? Because they knew that the minute you go see that grave, 
They cannot sit on their thrones. They will not be able to sit on their pulpits because people will remember what is Haq. They will not be fooled by these false kings who sit today pontificating and getting fat every hour. No, the real belief, they are afraid of that. And that's why they prevent us from going. That's why these people go with bombs. That's why they don't want us to rise. They don't want us to pull banners. They don't want us to talk about Hussein ibn Ali. They are afraid of that. Because they know that the culmination of the Holy Prophet's examples comes under these premises. So tonight, I'm not here to revive our spirits to think of Husseini, Husseini, Husseini. The spirit of Hussein alayhi salam is in the practical applications. Otherwise, we are doing disservice to the message of Imam Hussein. For in our ummah, we have people who are very, very ritual in Karbala. And more power to them. Keep it up. But for God's sakes, let's be good role models. Don't allow an enemy to say, oh, he has a lot of crying for Hussein. But when it's over, he seems to go to the other side. Don't do that. Consistency is the foundation to integrity. You want to have integrity in life? Be consistent. And no advice could be better than to be consistently good. For if we're not consistently good, what is the banner of integrity? Tell me that if you and I are wavering and flip-flopping one side to the other, what's our value? Our children are losing faith in society today for this reason. Not because the arguments from Hollywood and Bollywood is too strong. It's not strong. It's too childish. It's too foolish of people swinging their hips by gangs and doing silly things. That's too dumb and it's, it's too rudimentary. Every child will tell you this is silly. So then why are we so attracted? Because our arguments on our side are confusing. So therefore there's nothing left. And Hollywood wins the game. But if you and I simply hold on to the rope of Allah and teach our children to read Quran and gain knowledge and be good role models and uphold salah, you will see a whole different equation on this earth. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Allah in the Quran in Surah Al Hajj says the following. You read all the verses in the Quran when I was tonight. Yesterday I was reading verses of Quran, so subhanAllah, here's Hussein alayhi salam again. Here are the shuhada of Karbala again. Quran is talking about them. Exactly, to the T. SubhanAllah. Every time I read verses, I say, there it is again. The Quran has set the foundation and Imam Hussein is practicing it in its fullest form. Every Imam in its fullest form, the Quran is in action. Here's the verse. Alladheena idha dhukir Allah wajilat qulubuhum. والصابرين على ما أصابهم والمقيم الصلاة الله أكبر ومما رزقناهم ينفقون to those whose hearts tremble when Allah is mentioned and those who are patient under that which afflicts them and those who keep a prayer and spend out of what we have given them look صلاة Allah says يا أيها الذين آمنوا استعينوا بالصبر والصلاة Hmm? O believers, uphold. Sabri wa salah, two words inseparable. Patience, prayer. You will not see its fullest form than in Karbala. Patience, prayer. Patience, prayer. What is this salah? Let's talk about it. Allah says, uphold prayer. What is prayer? People ask prayer. Why should I pray? What's prayer? You will see that the salah of the Muslim is the kind that Allah has placed upon mankind. It's formulated. It's universal in message. It's profound. It's sublime. It's elevated. And it's nothing but a person's complete submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have watched people pray of different religions. I said, with due respect, without biases, I cannot compare the motion and the movement of prayer in a Muslim life compared to all other religions. Nothing comes even close. Then while I put my hand this way and pray, or get on my knees on a pew, you can't compare with ruku and sujood and qiyam. That when a person puts their head on the ground, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, peace be upon him, in his time 2,000 years ago, did it. Musa in his time did it. Ibrahim in his time did it. Adam alayhi salam did it. Which prophet did not do salah? Salah did not come in the time of the prophet. Salah has always been there. 
Salah, Allah says, Rukkaan sujjadan yabtaguna fadlam min Allahi wa ridwana simahum fi wujuhihim min atharis sujood. Thalika mathaluhum fi tawrati ka mathaluhum fi l'injil. Kazar'in akhraja shat'ahu fa'azaru fa'staghlada. Look at the verse. Allah says, you will see signs of prayer upon them. Who are they? The ones who are with the Prophet Muhammad Rasulullah. They are firm against the enemy, but they are merciful to each other. Like in Karbala, merciful. They loved each other. Each one was whispering in the other, could not wait to go forward the next morning. They could not wait to approach their, their shahada. They could not wait to see their Prophet. My God, do we have that heart? Often I ask that question when Imam Sahib Zaman Salam reappears. <laughs> and I am asked to obey the correct way. That as much as we have intadhar al-Mahdi, the Holy Prophet says, Afdalul ibadah, intadhar al-Mahdi. One of the best ibadah is to have the intadhar of the Mahdi of the time. Who is the Mahdi of the time? He reminds you of Allah. Through them you remember Allah. Sha'ir Allah. They are your signs. Even the Quran in the same Surah Al-Hajj. Allah says, come close to me through remembering my signs. Sha'ir Allah. Allah says, look at my signs and remember me. Tonight the commemoration of Karbala is the sign to remember, to put it in action, to look at ourselves and say, I am going to live this way because my role model has shown me. Salah. Let's talk about Salah. Allah says, Inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar wala dhikrullahi akbar. Indeed, prayer keeps you away from wrongdoing and evil. And it is a great Remembrance. Wala dhikrullahi akbar. Brothers and sisters as Muslims. Salah should be our foundation. I don't care if our iman is wavering. Salah, if you ever want to stabilize our lives, salah. Even if I'm not in the mood, get up and do it. Because if there is one thing Iblis is bothered, it's salah. Our rule is very simple. They say every prophet that came, the last sentence they said was as salah, as salah. Even a Jewish man came in Medina looking for the prophet. He said, where is this prophet of yours who has claimed to be a prophet? They said he passed away. They said, who witnessed his departure? A Jewish man came. He says, who witnessed his departure? They pointed to Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. They said on his lap. He goes to Imam Ali and says, tell me, this prophet of yours, what was the last thing he uttered before he breathed his last? Imam looks at him and says, as-salah, as-salah. The Jewish man says, ashhadu an la ilaha illa wa anna Muhammad rasulullah salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Imam Ali alayhi salam says that the last sentence of every prophet is salah, salah. Why? We are living in a world today. We say, why? What's this up and down business? Ruku, sujood. You know, we don't do fast. We don't have time for it. It is a testament to Allah. For this world, Allah says, Inna nafs al ammaratun bisu illa ma rahima rabbi. Yourself has a desire to deviate, Allah says, except by my mercy. Mercy is what? This aql. These role models, the Quran. Salah is a mercy. That when I pray, it hopefully will make my heart soft. And believe me, in my life, not because I'm biased, but I admire people who pray. But that person is a munafiq. I said, then inshallah he will change. But don't debilitate salah. Sure, Allah even says in the Quran, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ Sound, right? They want to show. An salatim. Alladinam an salatim sound. They want to show prayer to be boastful out there. Allah says, Woe to you. But prayer is an institution that's universal. That when you see a person praying, they will honor us. Because you are submitting. But in the West today, they have vilified this prayer. They have shown vis visions and images in Hollywood that a person who wants to commit suicide, a bomber who wants to kill people, 
First thing he does is he prays. So today we are afraid to pray in public because the Westerner is so single-tracked minded, so tunnel vision because media has created this satanic attitude that we are afraid of praying because that Westerner is looking at me. I wonder if this is his last. Hmm. But believe me, don't be afraid. That if you and I are afraid, then they will win. Let's not be afraid. In my life, when we travel, I know, even at the airports, people give us dirty looks. Some of them look, us, look at us with dignity, with respect. But believe me, there are those who wonder, who are we? What are we doing? And they come to us. What is this you just did? This is wonderful. There was a nun who came to our Islamic center in New York. She says, I have never seen people pray to God the way we have seen you for the first time. That I sat in your prayers. You people really worship God. We Christians don't worship God the way you do. You actually worship him the way he deserves to be worshipped. That's a nun telling me with her own mouth. Salah. In my university years, my roommates who were not Muslims, who never met Muslims in their lives before, they honored me and respected me that until today, they call me. They ask me for my advice and I ask them, why do you consistently do that? They said, when we saw you praying, we honored you so much, you made us feel good. How can we not call you for advice? Then when we went on a ski trip once with the youth and it was very busy, everybody's busy drinking. Everybody's busy having a good time. You know, when you go skiing, it's very hard. Everybody's drinking. Alcohol is rampant. We go down to the lodge and it was full house. We say, it's time to pray. The youth are saying to me, brother, it's, you know, hard. And I think of Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala. I think of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. I think of the Prophet. I said, Salah. There is no room for argument on this matter. That we are here and healthy for salah. That when we become sick, you think our money will help us? You think our family will help us? You think our community and the doctors will help us? No, it is the salah and the dua that helps insan. That helps us at the most critical time. So why should we not let, hold on to that? That when we went in, the lady said, there's no room. You've heard this story before, some of you. There is no room. We said, any room, give us one room. She says, well, there's room in the back of this room. Two of you can pray at a time. There was 50 of us. She said, okay, two of us will go at a time. You know, you have boots and everything. It's very heavy stuff. But Allah is testing us. Are you having a good time? Did you come down from your slopes? Did you remember me? I'm the one that's keeping you up there. I'm the one that's keeping you healthy. Have you forgotten me? Subhanallah, how Allah honored us. There was a young boy who was doubtful. And I remember they said, come inside. So he and I, we went in. It was the money room. The room was filled with money, cash. Hundreds of thousands of dollars cash sitting. He looks at his brother. Subhanallah, look how much money is in here. I said, when Allah gives it to us, he gives it us good. <laughs> hmm? Subhanallah. Believe me, that boy until today remembers that. He says, that honor. I said, the honor. Don't be afraid of people. You're on the airline, ask them. They refuse, make alternatives. Don't be afraid of them. Don't let them talk you out of it. It's not their duty to do that. I've been on British Airways, I've been on American Airlines, the British Airways, I remember, we were flying on the upper deck and they were not serving. And they laid the cloth in the back where they serve. And they said, as I'm walking in for prayer, they said, please pray for us. I said, subhanAllah, the power of prayer, I'm 30,000 feet in the air. And this woman, who's a non-Muslim, is asking me to pray for her. You know how enriching and how satisfying that is? That a flight attendant has stopped serving to honor a Muslim saying his prayers because they know probably this flight will remain full because of these people praying. Isn't that an honor? Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Salah. Let's look at the verses of the Quran. You find Ibrahim alayhi salam. That when he builds the Kaaba, he says, Oh Allah, save this city, protect it, and make my progeny the prayerful ones. I won't read all the verses, there's no time tonight. Surah Al Hajj, read it, the 22nd chapter of the Quran. Ibrahim is praying to Allah, Make my children prayerful. And he reads, Dua, Rabbi Jalni, Muqima Salati, wa min Dhurriyati. Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Oh my Lord, make me and my progeny prayerful. What's prayer? Why is prayer so important? It is the most powerful institution in the world of unity. That when we pray jama'ah, shoulder to shoulder, facing in one direction. That's a testament. That's a military of God. فَإِنَّ حِزْبَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْغَالِبُونَ The army of God, when it stands up to pray, it's the army of Allah. 
shoulder to shoulder. I had a military friend who was a Marine. We were in Medina doing Hajj in 93. He was crying for the first time he was in Medina. He says, I have never seen this in my life. I said, what do you mean? He says, I work in Texas. My job is to align the army at the blow of a trumpet so that they stand up in a straight line. And here I see the rich, the poor, the big, the small, the lay and the educated all just moving towards an army and they're rising and standing in line without any trumpets except the Adhan. And it's not a small army. You're talking three million people lined up that when you take a picture from above, it's like they were staged. Where in the world do you see that? Tell me. Where in the world do you see a community of people facing the direction towards Allah? That's the power of Islam. You want to talk about the social power, the individual power, the power of Salah is second to none. That when I even raise my hands, I am saying to the world, I am submitting to Allah. And I am surrendering. But you know what prayer is all about? I would like to explain it to us deeply. For many a times we forget the essence of prayer. Prayer is a reenactment of my, what we call my belief to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, as we say every day, we say, Shadu an la ilaha illallah, Shadu Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness there's no God but Allah and the Prophet is his messenger. Why do I bear witness? Allah says, keep bearing witness because you have a contract with me. You have a contract with me. Now, Salah is a reenactment of the contract five times a day. Why? Does Allah need my prayers? Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ We do not create jinn and ins. The jinn and mankind except to worship me. So we ask, does Allah need my worship? Is that why He created me? He created me to worship Him, so Allah needs worship? No, Allah does not need worship. No, Allah is not in need of our worship. None. In ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. When you do good, you do good for yourselves. Allah says, even if you don't pray, it does nothing to Allah. But salah is like plugging into the right outlet and getting the full juice to live happily and to progress progressively forever. That's why it says, illa li abudun. That's the power of salah, its fullest juice. But Imam Khomeini rahmatullahi alayhi gave a profound answer to this question, which stumped me at first. I didn't understand it. And then it hit me. He was seen once praying rapidly. And they said, why do you pray so quickly? He looked at the man and said, prayer begins when it ends. Subhanallah. I scratched my head. I said, what do you mean? Prayer begins when it ends. Subhanallah, then it came. He said, what you just did was the template. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You bearing witness to Allah? Yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah is just a source? Tawheed? Yes. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You bear witness that there's a Rahman and Rahim? Yes. And by the way, go deep into this. Rahman is the Prophet. Rahim ad Ahl al-Bayt. Maliki yawm al Master of the Day of Judgment? He said, yes. You agree? He says, yes. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِنْ Yes. إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ نَعْمْتَ عَلَيْهِ You admit that you're only asking Allah to guide you with those He has chosen. So you cannot choose anybody. You will not choose your role models unless Allah chooses. Because إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدْ إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ نَعْمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Guide me to the ones you have chosen, the ones you have given ni'mah. Tonight's commemoration is this. Remembrance of Ahlul Bayt is this. Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim, ghayr al maqdubi alayhim. Not the Muawiyahs, not the Yazids, not the Saddams, not these enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. Ghayr al maqdubi, not the ones who invoke your wrath like Ibn Ziyad and Ibn Sa'ad. No. And in today's world, we have them. The kings who are sitting today selling our souls, the ones who are pressing buttons and killing us. Not those who invoke the wrath of Allah. The lost people, the ones who don't know night from day, they're good people, but they've got no direction. Agnostics, people who put major tattoos on their face, they don't know what to do. They stick pins all over their face, they don't know what to do. They scream and they jump and they take their clothes off in public, they don't know what to do. Allah says, Don't follow them. Don't look at them. They're not your role models. You can't have any other body. There's nobody else. Look at the salah. Now, when I finish, I went to Surku. Subhana Rabbi al Azimi wa bihamdi. I'm seeking permission to go to Sujood. You are most high, Allah. Sami Allahu liman hamida. Allah, you have heard me. And you are most praiseworthy. I go into Sujood. Subhana Rabbi al Ala wa bihamdi. 
Allahu Akbar. Look at the depth of Salah. There is no glory but you. One who is praiseworthy. Notice Salah in sujood always has two. Two. Why two? Quick example. Two sujoods. No prayer in any school of thought that has sujood has three. And no prayer in any salah has one sujood. None. Why two? The Prophet explains the ayah. Mimma khalaqnahum. From it you were created, earth. And to it you will return. And from it you will be raised. So every sujood is a reminder. You came from earth. You're going to die and go back into this earth. And then come back from it and you won't go back into it. So people who ask about turba, you know this oros that we use? People think we worship it. This, what is this turba you're using, this stone? Aren't you worshipping something? I chuckle at them and I say, worship? Since when has an idol worshipper ever placed an idol under his head? An idol is in front of you, not under you. If it's under you, that means I'm above the idol. If this is the idol, then the carpet is your idol. Where do you draw the line? What silly argument is this? But people say this. Ignorance. But the turba, the prophet came out of the masjid. He had turba. He had earth on his forehead. Even his wife noticed this. This is even mentioned in Sahih Muslim. It's mentioned in Zamakhshari's book. It is mentioned in the Ahl Shia books, of course. That the prophet says, when you do sujood, make sure there is an earthly substance between you and your sujood. For it's meaningful. There is a reason for that sujood. So don't remove that turba. Imam Ali is called Abu Turab, the father of dust. That dust is a reminder once again that you came from it. And the Holy Prophet was asked, what is this life? He replied, the distance between two sujoods. He says, when you rise from the first sujood, that's this life. Hence, it is mustahab to say, astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubilay. You know this? Allah says, وَسَارِعُ إِلَىٰ مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Hasten to forgiveness that a paradise awaits you greater than what you can imagine in the universe. وَعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ This is a calling for the God-conscious ones. That sujood has two. Believe me, the Prophet says, every time you go to sujood, remember, you are an earthly being. That's why Imam Ali said, don't walk exultingly on the earth. Don't hit it hard. For that's the earth that will swallow you tomorrow. Be humble with it. They say our Ahlul Bayt, when they used to walk, you would hardly see footprints. Because they were very light walkers. They were humble on earth. So look, the prayer method. That the two sujoods, implication, meaningful. Now I have paid attention that my life when I rose from the first sujood, that Allah created me out of His mercy, and I will die. Kullu nafsin maut. Every self will taste death. We're all gonna go. Let's not be arrogant. Let us stop the fitna mongering. Let's stop gossiping. Let us stop committing adultery. Let's stop committing fornication. Let us stop our thievery and our lying and our cheating. It will do us no good. I tell you the most profound moment is when I go to the grave and I see a body being put in, I see myself there. You and I think it's somebody else who has died? Because believe me, many a times you and I think we will never die. Everyone will go, but me, how can I go? It's time I feel like I'm going to live here forever. Allah says, see that body? That's you. You're next. And believe me, it will catch you so fast, you won't have time to change your expression on your face. Get ready. Is it fear? Is it morbidity? Am I terrified? No. I'm preparing. I have a trip coming up. Plan it. Fill your bags with the right material so that when you go, you're ready. Isn't it a wonderful thing when a pious individual is being buried? As much as we cry for the loss of that individual, it's such a wonderful feeling. Wow, Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba, that you have succeeded by the Lord of the Kaaba, that you defeated Shaitan, that while you were on this earth, you were pious, you were noble, you kept your salah. Believe me, this Im implication is very important. But imagine now this whole movement of salah, and we do salam. This injunction does not exist in any religion. Our Christian brethren, they love God too. 
They love God very much, but they've got no instructions. They don't know how to turn, what to say. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Yes, this is like Surah Al-Fatiha, but there is no injunction, no wajibat, no wudu, no qibla, nothing. Look how honored we are as Muslims that we've been given a prescription that millions of people shoulder to shoulder will recite the same formula together. You want to talk about human unity on earth? You will not find a prescription by the Almighty Lord that brings about the greatest unity at a moral level than the moral level of Salah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. I can talk a lot about this, you know. And you know that you all know that. That when Imam Khomeini said salah begins when it ends, its practice is what stands. That the minute I meet a brother after my salah, if I'm harsh to him, I just negated what I just said. I just say to Allah, you are my giver. You are my mighty one. You are the one that I seek from. And now I'm becoming your slave. Allah says, look, you just promised me one thing. You've become a munafiq now. That's why the Imam Khomeini said, Prayer begins when it ends. That means now, after you've done it, walk the prayer. That between prayers, you say, I just prayed witness to God that I'm not going to do this. Then I'm not going to do this. That's why, inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Prayer keeps you away from wrongdoing and evil because it reminds us of that. But believe me, no matter how much we talk, it's the action and the transaction of personalities that truly indicates belief. Brothers and sisters, tonight, while we have the largest crowds, we have the largest audiences because this media of Imam Hussein that he left us with a great gift. We must utilize it fully. Often I get scared to stand on this pulpit. Believe me. If there is one thing that puts fear in me standing here, as great, as great an honor as it is, it's my fear of not utilizing every second to reach the hearts of myself and others. I don't want to waste tonight. I do not want to waste tonight's message. That until next year, we're still asking ourselves, what did we do within this year? Did we change? I don't want to waste it. Because I don't know if you and I will be alive between this Muharram and the next. We don't know. You cannot wait, brothers and sisters, please. Put it in action. That salah is a symbol with understanding and at least keep it. Our young generations especially, the admiration of salah is in Karbala. Let us describe it. Historically, as you know, Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he was in Safin, while he was in Safin, his companions, Imam Ali alayhi salam, were looking up at the sky. They say during that time, Imam Ali's army was deep in the battle. He says the, the, the battle was, was so intense at that moment that the entire army was inter-engaged. Blood was splashing all over the place. Arms were falling. Bodies were f falling. And in the middle of this, Imam Ali alayhi salam looks up to the sky, is looking for salah. Why is the Imam doing this? Because he wants to show us that this world has no meaning without salah. Has no meaning. Believe me, it's not an exercise. It's real. And I, when we raise our hands, it's sublime. When we put our head on the ground, ask even the Japanese, they'll tell you. When you put that head on the ground, it's evidence of your submission to a higher being. But it's not to impress people. It's to impress the heart. Alladina ida Allah wajilat quloobuhum. When Allah is mentioned, their hearts palpitate. Allah, who is Allah? Imam wants to excite that. Imam Ali alayhi salam looks at that and stops the, uh, the, the battle, but at that time, he could stop it. Because his army was large, was powerful. And he stopped the battle and said, prayer time. You enemies go pray, we will go our prayers. And Imam prays. But in Karbala, no. But let's take history. They say that on the day, on the 9th of Ashura, 9th of Muharram, not, not Ashura, 9th of Muharram, Ibn Sa'ad wanted to impress Ibn Ziyad. That when the letter of Ziljoshan came, and Ziljoshan said, listen, if you're weak, then I take over. Ibn Sa'ad says, oh, if that's the case, then I'm going to impress my master even more. How? I'm going to be even more vicious. Just like in a gang, 
When you have your gang leader who wants to do haram, to impress the gang leader, because this is maghdubi alayhi, the one who invokes the wrath of Allah, you'll find that to impress them, you become even more vicious. This is how Ibn Sa'd was. So Ibn Sa'd sends an army forward, and a skirmish starts. And Abbas alayhi salam, Muslim ibn Awsaja, Habib ibn Madahir, Zuhair ibn Qayn, great persons standing on the front, come into the skirmish, and they prevent the army from moving forward. Imam Hussein alayhi salam comes and says, what is this? The battle has begun. This was on the 9th. Imam quickly goes with Abbas alayhi salam and seeks a truce and meets Ibn Sa'd. He said, oh Ibn Sa'd, what's your point? He said, I have been commanded to get your allegiance or I must kill you immediately. Imam says, okay, can you at least give us one night to worship God? Look, what is the Imam thinking? He's not worried about his life. He's not worried about his family more than to thank and to pray to Allah. You and I are lovers of Ahlul Bayt, brothers and sisters, I say this to you. If our love for Salah under these premises does not hit our hearts, then our love for Ahlul Bayt is shallow and weak. For Imam Hussain is asking, give me one night to do Salah. Ibn Sa'd said, I will give it to you. They said, when the Imam comes back, the army gets together, Imam Hussein's army, inside the tent. And the historians have noted that we heard buzz, a buzzing sound. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la wa bihamdi. Tasbih, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Tasbih and Salah, the whole night. They have not eaten, they did not drink water. Their lives are going to be butchered in the next day. Their women and children are crying and they're doing takbiratul haram. Allahu Akbar, going into sujood. You want to see a better vision than this? Here it is. And he prays. All night Imam Hussain alayhi salam prays. Up to Fajr time. As you know, as the Fajr battle starts, we'll talk about it tomorrow inshallah. To give honor to some of those shuhada who have left. They were companions who came the next morning. They came the next morning, as you know, in the battle. There was a soldier by the name of Uns ibn Harith Asadi. He was a companion of Imam Hussain from Banu Asad tribe. They say he was so old, his eyebrows were hanging. That's how old he was. He comes and holds the hands of Imam Hussein tight. He says, I give bay'ah to you and I want to be sacrificed for you. Imam looks at this old man, how can you even give permission? But the man was just dying to go forward to become martyred. Historians say he took even his turban and he tied his eyebrows so that he could see. And he went forward and charged and became shaheed. Imam had to witness that besides all his other companions that he saw and his children. Subhanallah, you find Imam Hussain alayhi salam on the day of Ashura. As you know, in the middle of the battle, as the day is progressing, as you know, the battle started at Fajr. Umar ibn Sa'd takes the arrow to convince his master how vicious he is. He says, bear witness that this arrow of Umar ibn Sa'd bin Abi Waqqas is the first one to start this battle. And you know, according to Islamic law, anybody who starts the battle is the oppressor. So there is no gray area in Karbala, no gray area. So the battle begins. They say the battle gets very, very heated. And at Dhuhr time, peak time, Imam is fighting. Imam only had 72 warriors, only 72. The rest, 20, 30 of them were children, people who never fought in a battle, who went forward also and became shaheed. Even a woman, as you know, became shaheeda, the wife of Abdullah ibn Umair. So Abu Thamama, Saidi was standing next to the Imam while they're fighting. He looks up and Imam looks at him and says, Abu Thamama, what are you looking at? He says, I'm checking if it is the time of Salah. Imam says, may Allah raise you with the prayer for one, so Abu Thamama, for this critical time. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu sta'inu bis sabri wa salati. Allahu Akbar, be patient with sabr and salah. He says, you remember prayers? He said, that's why we're here. He says, give me the honor, O oh, blessed Imam, to pray with you for the last moment. 
Imam sends a message to the enemies and said, it is prayer time, let us stop. You know, it's amazing to see that this battle started at Fajr and now it's Dhuhr. 72 armies versus 30,000, the Imam is holding them back, subhanAllah. You want valor? You want strength? Imam is teaching us, don't be afraid of the superpowers of the world today. Don't be afraid of the armaments these people have today. Don't be afraid of these ideas that psychological warfare they give us. That Yes, we are powerful, you are weak. Imam is saying, look at us. How few we were in number. How few we were in number and look how we held them back. That even at that critical moment we didn't forget salah. Subhanallah. Amar ibn Sa'ad agrees. But you know, Hasin bin Namir hears this asking. He said, the prayer of Hussein ibn Ali is not even accepted. Why does he want to pray? Hussein bin Namir. There's a story about Hussein bin Namir. We'll discuss it later. About how Imam Zain al-Abidin deals with him later on. But tonight suffice it to say, Hussein bin Namir says to Imam Hussein, your prayer is not even accepted. They say, Muslim ibn Awsaja comes forward and says, that the prayer of the Holy Prophet is not accepted. The one that Allah has chosen is not accepted. And you, your prayer is accepted. You, oppressor, your prayer is accepted. Imam says, leave them alone. We will pray Salatul Khawf. We'll pray the prayer of fear where the Imam leads. And the army comes and prays one rak'ah. And the army goes back and defends. And another army comes behind the Imam while the Imam is leading. Saeed ibn Abdullah was one of those who was also with Imam Hussein salam, in Karbala. That the Imam, as you know, Ali Akbar reads Adhan, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> they all line up behind him. And the Imam is leading Salah. The enemy say that if this Imam of these people leads prayers, our army will have soft heart to see that this is a believer this is a very pious man this is a very god conscious man we don't want that we want them to be impulsive to kill him right now because we're afraid we will lose his battle imam is doing a last ditch effort that while he's remembering allah then maybe you will see him praying that maybe your hearts will stop you and maybe you won't shoot another arrow but rather that while the Imam is doing takbiratul haram, the army comes around and starts shooting. Sayyid bin Abdullah says, I can't allow that arrow to come. So he stands in front of Imam Hussein alayhi And as the arrows are coming, he's putting his body towards it. And the arrow is hitting him. And the arrow is hitting his neck. And the arrow is hitting his face. To the time that by the time Imam Hussein alayhi salam is reading the salam, Sayyid is breathing his last. And he's gasping to Imam Hussein. He says, Allah curse these people for what they're doing to you but yeah oh my master Abba Abdullah have I fulfilled my obligations to you Imam Hussein looks at him and says oh Sayyid Allah has kept paradise for you for what you've just done they say the evening had reached where Abbas had become martyred Ali Akbar had become martyred all the companions had become martyred the brothers of Abbas had become martyred. Imam Hussein alayhi salam stands in front of the people and says, Now I'm all alone. Hal bin Nasir in Yansuruna. Allahu Akbar. Hal bin Nasir in Yansuruna. Imam doesn't need help. We need help. He's telling us, rise. That even though I'll be killed, my message will never be killed. My position will never be taken away. He says, Hal bin Nasir in Yansuruna. In the tent, he hears a little baby crying. <laughs> the women and children are crying. His little baby, Abdullah, whose mother was Rabah. As you know, Rabab was one of those great women in Karbala. We will talk about Rabab. My God, if we have women like that in our societies, what more could we ask for? Rabab had two children, as you know, Sakina, who was four years old, her little girl, who was holding on to the leg of her uncle waiting for that water, and her little brother Abdullah, known as Ali Asghar. Imam is asking, is there anyone to help me? Imam says, 
The epitome of innocence on earth is a baby. You cannot find greater innocence than in a baby. This is Karbala. That while there are little children, old men like Unsim and Harith, who was well in his hundred, close to hundred years of age. Now Imam is saying the final solution. I will leave no stone unturned, for they were blacks, they were whites, they were rich, they were poor in Karbala to represent us. This one takes the cup. <laughs> this one takes the cup. He enters the tent and he sees the Blessed Mother of Allah holding this baby who is almost unconscious because it's without any water for days. <laughs> the baby has cried itself to the point of close to being unconscious. Imam goes to us, Rabab, and says, give me the child. <laughs> maybe if I take it to these wretched people, maybe there will be some softness in their heart that before I leave this world as a father, I have quenched the thirst of my child. Can you imagine a mother letting go of her child? <laughs> I know when I travel, and if I leave my daughter behind, I cry. I don't know if I will see her again. <laughs> Imagine a mother having to let go of this baby, knowing the decree is coming, that the enemy is outside with sharpened swords. And now this baby has to be taken. Allahu Akbar. Imam takes this baby. They said it was partially unconscious. The baby was so, so tired. <laughs> He comes out and he stands in front of the army. He says, people, your grudge is with me. Your jealousy is with me. Your hatred is for me. What wrong has this baby done? And Imam covers it because the sun was very The sun was very hot. He raises the baby up and he says, what wrong has this baby done to you? At least feed it water. And the soldiers start looking and they start feeling the pain that yes, what are we doing? Shibr, the enemy of Allah, noticed that if this continues, there will be mutiny in the army of Yazid. He looks at Hurmala, who was an archer, and says, Silence that child now. Respond to this action. Respond to this question now. <laughs> Respond quickly. Hormala was an archer who was very, very seasoned in shooting. That while the Imam is talking and giving them good advice, an arrow pierces the neck of Abdullah, which strikes the chest into Imam Hussein. And they say the baby's arm starts beating its father's chest because it's breathing the last breath of its life. <laughs> Ya yatun nafsul mutsma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatun marziya That the baby becomes lifeless. Imam sees blood, he looks up, he says, Ridham mikadai wa tasleem an li amri. Imam goes towards the tent, he says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiyat. He says, the mothers are waiting and I'm bringing this baby back. He returns, he says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiyo. They say seven times, Imam Hussain alayhi salam goes back and forth. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiyo. Ridham bi kathai wa taslim an li amri. Oh Allah, we are pleased with your decree. Imam Hussain brings the baby back. And the blood is dripping on his body of this innocent, beautiful child. On judgment day, it will ask, Be ayyidam min qutilat. For what sin did I commit that they killed me? Just like today, children are being blown up in, in the Middle East, in Gaza, and bombs. And we see pictures of children. Let's remember these children who are being killed every day. No difference. 
Imam takes the scabbard of his sword and he begins to dig a hole to dig this beautiful precious child on the side of the tent. And you find historians have noted, final point my brothers, that the blessed Imam buries it and covers it and leaves it alone. This is historians say after our blessed Imam had become martyred and his head was placed on the spear, which we'll talk about tomorrow, inshallah. The soldiers needed to collect the gold. Abundance diverts you till you come to the grave. They wanted to count their loot. They look for this little grave. <laughs> And they dig it out the next day. And they take the blessed body and they sever the head. And they put it on a spear to take it back to the king. Allah lahnat Allah al qawm al zalimin. Wa sayyalamu alladhina zalamu. Ayyamun qalabin yan qalibun. The mothers are crying tonight, brothers and sisters. Tonight is the night of ibadah. The night of remembrance. The night of reflection. The night of change. The night of change tonight. Matam ya Hussein.